Hello, 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 everybody, and welcome to my Adventures in the Forgotten Realms Draft Guide. In this video, I'm going to be showing you all the information you need to know to draft Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. But before I get into it, I want to remind you that if you enjoyed the video, hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel for more content, and comment below with your questions, thoughts, and feedback. And without further ado, let's get to it. In this guide, I am going to be discussing the set mechanics, top three commons by color, archetype overviews, combat tricks, traps, combos, and more. So there's a lot of information here, and let's get to it. Starting off with the set mechanics, there are three to be aware of. There are dungeons, rolling a d20, and the class mechanic. Starting things off with dungeons, this is the biggest new mechanic, and it is featured on tons of cards, and these are the three dungeons you have to choose from. Essentially, there are cards that say venture into the dungeon, and when you do so, you get to choose one of these dungeons and begin your adventure. So you can choose Dungeon of the Mad Mage, Lost Mine of Phandelver, or the Tomb of Annihilation. The Dungeon of the Mad Mage is the longest dungeon, and it has some sweet reward towards the end of it. The Lost Mine of Phandelver is kind of a middle-of-the-road dungeon, and then the Tomb of Annihilation is a very aggressive dungeon that involves lots of life loss. And it can be a very good for if you're being an aggressive deck. And the key with these dungeons is as you go through them, you start at the top and then you move down one spot into the next room every time you have another card that says venture into the dungeon. And then when you complete the dungeon, you can start a new one next time you venture into the dungeon. You can either choose a different dungeon entirely or you can go back to the same dungeon again. You can't go through multiple dungeons at the same time, but hopefully you're going to be churning through these dungeons and going through however many you want in the game if you can get enough of these venture into the dungeon triggers. And which sorts of cards have those? Well, these are some of the cards that have venture into the dungeon. A card like Veteran Dungeoneer just enters the battlefield and you venture into the dungeon. And a card like Wandering Troubadour, every time you play a land and have the Troubadour in play, you'll get to venture. And then Clattering Skeletons, of course, does it when you it dies. There's also instants and sorceries that just say venture into the dungeon as part of their resolution. And these are the sorts of cards that help you explore those dungeons and get those value. Essentially, a lot of the time with the dungeon cards, you get more rewards the further into the dungeon that you get so just having a single veteran dungeoneer isn't going to be as good in your deck as having a bunch of cards that let you venture into the dungeon because when you complete them you can get those big rewards that come at the end the next mechanic is rolling a d20 it's very simple when you play one of these cards it will say roll a d20 as part of its resolution or when it enters the battlefield and then you will roll the d20 and add that extra effect it's not going to be a downside effect it's going to be a little bit of an upside or a significant upside depending on what you roll so the worst you're going to get with swarming goblins is one goblin but if you roll decently well you'll get two goblins and then if you roll incredibly well you'll get three goblins so rolling a d20 is a pretty simple mechanic but definitely a fun one and then finally there is the class mechanic it only appears on uncommons or higher but it does look a little bit weird the first time you see it essentially you play it for the mana value in the upper right and then as you level it you get the extra level ability so with wizard class you play it you immediately have no maximum hand size and then when you pay three mana to level it up to level two you get to draw two cards and then when you pay the third third ability you get that static ability as part of the wizard class so they're relatively straightforward once you get the hang of them but they are a little bit confusing to look at the first time Moving on to the top commons, starting off with white. At number one is Priest of Ancient Lore. Just a rock solid three drop, draws you a card so it replaces itself, and then gaining one life is nice for winning those close races and also for triggering life gain synergies in the set. At number two is Planar Ally. It is a little bit expensive at five mana, but it helps you venture into the dungeon consistently, which can really help you complete those dungeons and get the powerful payoffs that are at the end of the dungeon. And then at number three is Minimus Containment. Sometimes you just need a removal spell, and this can take care of any non-land permanent, which is really nice. Giving them a treasure isn't the best, but it is still a catch-all removal spell, and you're going to want to have access to it. Moving on to blue, at number one is Ginny Windseer. It's a 3-3 flyer for 4 mana, which is just a solid rate on its own, and then tacking on some scry to it makes it extra powerful. And some cards in blue in particular care about just rolling dice, and so this even triggers those for some extra upside. So Genie Wins here is a really nice card. At number 2 is Charmed Sleep, which is just the sort of removal spell that blue gains access to. It might not be as powerful as some of the other blue cards, but it's less replaceable than some of the other blue cards as well, because it's a very unique effect for blue, getting some removal, and so it's a card you're going to want to prioritize. At number 3 is Contact Other Plane, which is a nice card draw spell. If you are getting that scry 2 that before you draw 2 cards, it's going to really help you churn through your deck to find you exactly what you need as i said with the genie wins here sometimes just draw just rolling a dice is going to be beneficial for your deck so that's a nice bit of upside as well and it's just a nice way to get some extra card advantage in your blue decks 
Moving on to the black cards, at number one is Grim Bounty. This looks like a four mana spell, but it does rebate you one of the mana when you cast it, kills any creature you care about, which is just really powerful. And in this set, there are ways to use treasure other than just for pure mana value, uh, just casting them, using them to help cast spells. You can get some extra value out of that treasure, and so that's a little bit of upside as well. So Grim Bounty takes the number one slot. At number two is Precipitous Drop, which is another removal spell that comes attached with some value. It does take a little bit to scale into the game, unlike Grim Bounty, which can just kill anything right away. So it takes the number two slot, but it is definitely very powerful. And then at number three is the Yuangti Fang Blade, which is a nice creature on its own, just a three mana two two death touch is good. And then it also punishes them if they are unable to block it by venturing into the dungeon. So a really nice number three pick in red at number one is dragon's fire which is not only a really cool name but also a really cool spell other than the flames which are presumably very hot dealing three damage and then sometimes dealing even more damage uh if you have some dragons going on is really nice and just the perfect card for any red deck uh at number two is valor slinger valor singer actually it's slinging that tram tam tambourine in its left hand but it's singing as it battles and it buffs up all of your other creatures and even can buff up itself which is really nice so it's at on its baseline a three mana three three attacker but being able to make your other creatures more powerful in combat is really nice upside and helps you use smaller creatures more effectively which makes it a nice number two pick and then at number three is hobgoblin captain which is just a great two drop kind of uh sizable in the early game so it can really crack in for some damage and then in the mid game when it would be trading it can use its pack tactics to get through and be even difficult to block in the mid game moving on to the green commons at number one is owl bear which is just a great card five mana for a four four trampler is a little bit underrated, but when you draw a card to replace itself, all of a sudden you're in business, and Owlbear is a great card. At number two is Spoils of the Hunt, which it is important to note is a punch spell rather than a fight spell. <laughs> punch spell refers to a card where your creature does the damage, but their creature doesn't deal damage back. Um, so Spoils of the Hunt is going to be effective in that means, and you can even use it as a combat trick sometimes if you have treasures lying around to maybe buff up one of your creatures to trade with something and then kill one of their creatures in mid-combat. So keep in mind that it is an instant and it is a punch spell. And then at number three is the Hill Giant Herd Gorger, just a massive six-drop creature that can gain you some life to help you stabilize if you are playing a bigger green deck, and it's just a really nice curve topper. So that's the sort of card you're going to want in your green decks. Moving on to the color rankings, at number one is blue. There's just a lot of very powerful commons in blue going down even past the top three, so it gets the number one slot. Similar in green, very powerful commons, and also a nice little curve uh, of going that owl bear into the herd gorger is a nice gonna gonna be very good against the aggressive decks in the format. White gets number three slot. In addition to the powerful commons we already saw, there's also some nice equipment synergies running around in white and just some good aggression overall. Black comes in next. It's got some solid removal, some good creatures, uh, but and overall, it's basically there. All these cards, uh, colors, I must say, are very close in power level. There's not like a runaway color. It doesn't look like this is just the rank. This black is only slightly behind the other colors. And then coming in last is red. It doesn't have as many powerful cards as the other colors. It's not as deep as them, but it is by no means not powerful. It's definitely worth playing still. Moving on to some archetypes, starting off with red, white, there is an equipment sub theme to the aggressive deck. So make sure you have a good curve and then maybe throw some extra equipments in there for that extra synergy. Next up is blue, black. It can be a nice control deck, but it can also be a little tempo -y deck that takes advantage of some of these cards that trigger when they deal combat damage to a player. So you can play these early in the game and then destroy your opponent's blockers and get in for some extra damage, draw some extra cards, even get some treasure with Horde Robber and just use blue black as a tempo shell which is a really fun twist on the archetype next up is green white which is a life gain deck it's got some nice creatures that grow when you're gaining life and then some cards like the prosperous innkeeper that can gain you life consistently and that's really the key to success with this sort of deck is to have consistent life gain and then cards that care about having that consistent life gain Next up is blue red, which is the color of dice rolling. So there's some payoff cards like Faraday, Devil's Chosen, and then Brazen Dwarf is a common payoff for the deck. And a card like Pixie Guide can help you roll multiple dice to ensure you're always getting the more powerful effect on your spells. Next up is Black Green, which is a grindy sacrifice value deck. It uses cards like Sepulcher Ghoul to power out your sacrifice synergies and also to be able to cast your purple worm on turn five as consistently as possible so the purple worm is just an absolute beating if you can get it down on that turn five and keep in mind that you can just have your creatures trade in combat and then play it but by having a sack outlet like sepulcher gruel you can guarantee it even if your opponents are unwilling to trade so nice black green value deck there 
Moving on to White Blue, it's a color combination that cares about venturing into the dungeon. Hama Pashar, Ruin Seeker, is certainly a card that you're going to want to venture into the dungeon of the Mad Mage with, so you can take advantage of doubling those very powerful rooms later in the dungeon, if at all possible. But then there's also just cards like Cloister Gargoyle that can pay you off for completing one of the smaller dungeons relatively quickly. Moving on to Red Green, it's a nice aggressive color combination. You just get some powerful early drops like Targnar, and then you can curve that into Hulking Bugbear and Inspiring Bard and that sort of thing, going up the curve, just playing powerful creatures that can help you punch through that extra damage. Moving on to White Black, it's another adventuring color combination, and it also really pays you off for completing dungeons. So maybe you're not going through the dungeon of the Mad Mage with White Black, you're going through maybe the dungeon, the, the Fandelver one, uh, or the aggressive one. And uh, yeah, the, 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 the names on those dungeons are a little bit difficult. I just think of it as Fandelver and the aggressive one, clearly. And then the dungeon of the Mad Mage has a very iconic name. But basically with White Black, you can complete one of the smaller dungeons first so that your Gloom Stalkers are being double striked up. Your dungeon crawlers are coming back from when they traded earlier. And then your Barrowwind can also attack and get back your cards. So nice little uh, dungeoneering <laughs> color combination there. Uh, blue green is just a nice value ramp it's typical blue green stuff play big creatures draw cards get extra lands into play and that sort of thing as well using gretchen titchwillow as a nice defensive body that's also a mana sink and then just playing massive cards like the blue dragon and powered out by find the path that sort of thing black red is the <laughs> treasure color combination i just really wanted to point out how brutal it is to go kalane into jaded cell sword on turn three just smack him with a five four haste that's certainly going to be fun to do and very frustrating when your opponents do it to you so just be aware that black red definitely has some devastating starts it can up it can get up to and that it does use treasure as a resource very well so make sure that you aren't just using those treasures willy-nilly that with your black red deck you save them so you can maybe draw that extra card with your hired hex blade or all of your other treasure needs Moving on to the combat tricks in the set, uh, I'm just going to go over them very briefly because there are quite a few of them. Paladin's Shield is one you don't want to get blown out by because it's going to stick around and continue to provide value. Rally Maneuver is also, it's it's a little bit more expensive, so maybe I'm easier to play around, but still definitely a very scary card. You hear something on watch is very flexible, but doesn't actually buff up the stats by that much in combat. Your Ambush on the Road is similar. It's got some flexibility, but it's cheap and only gives plus one power. In blue, there's Mordenkainen's Polymorph which is just the typical kind of make a creature slightly bigger and maybe give it flying to give evasion, but not a powerful card generally, so you're not going to see it all that often. Shocking Grasp is more powerful and is one that you really don't want to get wrecked by because it is going to get a two for one a lot of the time if it does go off perfectly in combat for your opponents or for you. And so you don't want to walk into the Shocking Grasp track trap. In black, there isn't really a combat trick, but Manticore is kind of like giving a creature death touch for the turn. So if they make a suspicious attack, definitely be uh, wary of the Manticore. In red, there are several cards. There's Critical Hit to give Double Strike, Dueling Rapier to give plus two plus oh. You come to the Null Camp, plus three plus one. All three of those cards are not really buffing the toughness all that much. So if you block their 2-2 two -two with a 2-3, you're generally still going to be fine. Or if you block their 2-2 two -two with a 3-3, three -three, more like, because you come to the Null Camp does buff toughness a little bit. Also, you come to the Null Camp can make two creatures unable to block. So that's definitely something to be aware of as well moving on to some final combat tricks if your opponent makes an alpha attack and they are a red deck think of you see a pair of goblins because that can buff their entire team with plus two plus zero uh, and then in green there's a host of combat tricks there's bull strength which is not really scary per se because two mana for plus two plus two isn't that good but be aware of the untap effect because that could definitely be something that gets you uh, choose your weapon is a nice one because it also doubles as a removal for a flyer which is something that's good to have access to in the main deck hunter's mark I didn't really want to call it a combat trick, but I did want to talk about it because this could be one of the most savage blowouts you ever experience. If you're playing a blue deck and your opponent plays this in mid combat to give their creature plus one plus one to win the combat and kill one of your other cards, then you're just going to lose the game almost every time. Um, keep in mind that this is also a punch spell. The creatures don't actually fight. And so even if, you, if your opponent attacks you and has four mana up, definitely keep this card in mind because it could single-handedly lose you the game if your opponent has it, and it, it's definitely worth keeping in mind. Very, very powerful. It's not really a combat trick in many senses. It's just a removal spell, but when it gets to double as a combat trick and a removal spell, it's just going to be game-ending, so keep that card in mind. Definitely one to be wary of. And then finally, Wild Shape, just kind of weird-looking combat trick slash give your creature hexproof deal, but definitely one to be aware of. Moving on to some cards that are traps. 
First is you find some prisoners. Overall, the, it looks like the two modes would give you some flexibility, but destroying an artifact isn't going to come up that often, and the interrogate them is just not worth playing it as a card, so you're not going to want to play you find some prisoners. Number two, Divine Smite is just going to be a sideboard card. Some of these like color hosing instants, there's a whole cycle of them, are fine to play as their default mode, even if you're not specifically hosing the color, but phasing out a creature is not worth a card, and if you do find yourself in a spot where you're going to have to phase something out instead of being able to kill a black creature because your opponent's not playing black, you're going to be really unhappy so you're going to want to use this as a sideboard card for best of three or if you're just playing best of one just don't play the divine smite at number three is split the party this card is just a bit expensive and clunky and generally if you viewed this as a five mana bounce two creatures at sorcery speed that's what you're going to be getting a lot of the time and that's just not going to be worth it so you're not going to want to play split the party in most of your decks and then finally devour intellect has a lot of text and it looks like it would be like a little thought seize type deal but you're not going to want to spend your treasure on a one drop and it's not even that super powerful of an effect if you top deck it later it's not good so overall just steer clear of devouring intellect uh, finally, or not finally, there's still a couple more things after this, but I love getting to this part because the combos are always a ton of fun. Starting things off with Soul Knife Spy and Thieves Tools, you get to put the Thieves Tools onto the Soul Knife Spy and then attack your opponent with your unblockable 3-2 and draw cards and take over the game, which is really nice. There's also some other cards that could reward you for uh, hitting your opponent consistently, and Thieves Tools is also good with those. Uh, next up is Price of Loyalty and Sepulcher Ghoul. Uh, you can essentially steal your opponent's creature with Price of Loyalty, attack them with it, and then sacrifice it to Sepulcher Ghoul. And essentially, in, in this way, you're going to be able to use Price of Loyalty as a removal spell, and you can probably get it late because your opponents aren't going to be able to use this card as effectively if they don't have the sack outlets. So definitely Definitely something to keep in mind. Next up is Green Dragon plus Spare Dagger. The Green Dragon makes it so that all of your creatures essentially have Death Touch, uh, which is really nice. Um, but your opponent might not have to block those creatures, and so you give them Death Touch for a turn, you attack them, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, I didn't get to use my trigger very well. But if you have a Spare Dagger <laughs> attached to one of your creatures, then your Green Dragon is essentially throwing a dagger like a absolute beast and throwing a poison dagger at somebody to snipe them for with that one damage and because uh until end of turn whenever a creature in a book controls is dealt damage you destroy it the dagger dealing one damage will destroy any creature so you can probably kill some pretty big things with that combination and then finally the combination of clever conjurer plus find the path you enchant a land up with your find the path it now taps for two mana and your clever conjurer is able to untap lands so that's one of the keys with clever conjurer is that you can untap lands with it definitely not something that is always going to immediately come to mind it just says untap permanent uh, target permanent not target non-land permanent which a lot of these cards would say and so being able to use the clever conjurer to really ramp out some threats with the find the path is going to be quite nice Moving on to the fixing available in the set. In the land slot, there is Evolving Wilds. There's not a cycle of dual lands around, so keep that in mind. Evolving Wilds is all you're going to get in terms of land slot fixing, and it is a pretty good one. It can, If you have a, a, a splash color, you can play Evolving Wilds, one of that basic, and then go get it. In green, the only fixing is you happen on a glade, which is an uncommon. You can get basic land cards with it, but you can't reliably get you happen on a glade because it is an uncommon. Though I do want to remind everybody, that in addition to all of the cool uses for treasure this set, you can also just use treasures to fix your mana. So if you have a card like Unexpected Windfall, you can use it, the treasures that you generate to uh, splash cards in addition to just fixing your mana normally or ramping out big threats. So keep that in mind with your treasures. Moving on to one final tip in the set is that enchantments are easier to destroy than normal. So white has access to Dawnbringer Cleric, which has a lot of modes. And so it's definitely just a main deckable card. And if you see there, Dispel Magic, Destroy Target Enchantment. Black gets access to a 6-drop that's actually pretty solid, and Anti-Magic Cone on the Baleful Beholder makes each opponent sacrifice an enchantment. And then in green, you find a Cursed Idol is definitely a card that can be main decked if necessary, especially if there's some venture synergies going on. And destroying target enchantment is definitely a relevant part of that card as well. So if you do have some enchantments, especially the class enchantments, and you're going to consider dumping a lot of mana into them, just keep in mind that they might just not stick around for as long because your opponent could easily have one of these enchantment removal spells. Similarly, if there's an enchantment removal spell that you're using it's funny because enchantment removal and enchantment removal spells are, are one of one of them is a removal spell that is an enchantment like a the charm sleep that we looked at in blue and then they you find a cursed idol is a enchantment removal spell because it kills enchantments but keep in mind that if you're using a card like charm sleep it might not stick around forever so uh maybe try to close the game quickly or if you really have to kill a threat use your unconditional removal on that and then charm sleep something else so just something to keep in mind
that is going to do it for this draft guide though i really do hope you enjoyed it thank you so much for watching and if you did enjoy it remember to hit that thumbs up button subscribe to the channel for more and comment if you have any questions or feedback and in the comment section down below leave hashtag ready for adventure to let me know you made it all the way till the end of the video that is going to do it for this one i really do hope you enjoyed it and i will talk to you next time